to our first home on Garden Show. Did you have a good journey here? It's been great. Thank you very much for having me. Lovely. Um, have you had a little look around Whitehaven at all? I've had half an hour to have a kind of quick blitz right, right across the harbour. <laughs> Amazing place and then such a nice day as well. Yeah. Yeah. We've been blessed by the weather, haven't we? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I know later on that you're going to go up to the gardens and set your seats. Um, and I know you've got a big thing about gardening not being seen as a low paid um, area of work, really. We've actually had both volunteers and apprentices from Lakes College redoing those gardens there. How do you feel about horticultural apprenticeships being available? Is that going to help when it comes to making it better for our higher as well? I think it's so important. I think horticulture has this this really strange idea of propagating itself as if it's poorly made. In fact, one of the first things you'll always hear about people who are promoting careers in horticulture is, is to say that you know it's not well paid, but every industry has low paid jobs. Um, but it isn't definitely not reflective of horticulture can be incredibly well paid as long as it's valued. And I think the stuff you're doing in a greening and political area really demonstrates you know, how much how valued that can be. Yeah, lovely. Uh, now obviously you've brought your book along today. Um, so what's what's the call about? Well they've appeared out of nowhere. Oh of course, which one is it? Because I've got a whole bunch of them. Wait, we have okay, one okay, here. okay, okay, so great you drugs. drugs. That's that's uh, one of the ones I came up with a couple of years ago and it's about um, Growing uh, a whole range of different things that can really easily appear really easily at home. And a great scientific plausibility behind how, how they work in terms of Right. Because a lot of pills yeah, yeah. are actually developed from originally plant and herbal recipes, yeah, aren't you know, they? So. Approximately 50% of the most commonly prescribed pharmaceutical drugs, and the stuff that NHS provides, the stuff that's available in boots, are derived from natural sources. Um, so people have this, this idea that there's a big black line in their minds that separates chemical, synthetic, potentially really effective but loads of side effects from kind of natural, airy, fairy, probably won't do anything but it's safe. Yeah. Really, that's a cultural distinction, that's not a scientific distinction. To me as a scientist, it doesn't matter whether um, whether the chemical comes from the leaves of a plant or is found in a pill, it matters whether it works. Um, and in many instances it's the same chemical. Right, excellent. James, do you, do you think that schools should be getting more involved with the kids and letting them see how things have grown and so that they don't think everything comes out of a packet? I'm speaking from a chef's point of view, yeah. so for me it's very frustrating. Yeah. Children think everything comes out of a packet. Yeah. So for them to see how things are grown and how it, you know, even even a lap, even having a little flower or a vegetable patch at school. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's important. Like for example, so I went to a Singapore State School, and my boss was I was the biggest kid in school, so I was forced to play rugby as a kid in like 35 degree heat, monsoon and rain. So I don't like. I have like developed a phobia of mud and like, smell of mud. I used to hate beetroot because it tastes like mud. I didn't realize. This until I started growing up. The, the chemical that's found in beetroot that gives that kind of soily flavor is genetically determined. It's a chemical called geosmin, and it's only found in certain varieties. So, by picking the right variety, the, like, the flavor of beetroot and that muddy, earthy flavor is completely independent. I love beetroot now, and I didn't know that. And if you like, if you were stuck with supermarket varieties, which are generally quite high in geosmin, yeah. you'd have never have known. And it's only by growing your own you realize that this, this is a massive array of choice out there. If only you kind of led into it. Yeah, and growing your own is the only way to get a hold of it. And growing your own, you do get a fabric to taste as well. Depending on, you depending on the variety and the how you grow it, um, absolutely. You know, supermarket <laughs> strawberries are usually picked when they're pink, as opposed to when they're red. And pink strawberries contain less than 1% of the volatile compounds that give strawberries their flavour, as opposed to red ones. Right. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a no-brainer. But I know you've talked about the fact that people think to grow their own potatoes, perhaps, but there's a lot of options of what you can grow more now, isn't there? Well, I think the really sad thing is most grow your own advice is based on lifestyles of the early 40s. I saw when my granddad was doing it. My granddad in rural Wales had a very different life to my life in Central London. And I think growing your own potatoes is one of those things. Main crop potatoes, regular types. If you were to do a Pepsi challenge in a wine bird test, homegrown versus supermarket board, I think in a million years you can be able to tell the difference. So people say that growing your own plant can taste better. I don't think that's very true as a scientist. I think sometimes it does. You know, and with things like strawberries and things like sweet corn and things like tomatoes, there's a massive measurable flavor. Onions, sprouts, sweets. 
not so much. Um, I think it's you know it's it's our job as scientists to really say that if you love growing your own potatoes and it works for you, that's great. But if you really want it to live up to the claim of growing your own, you've got to pick your species right. And yeah. Joe, do you, do you think the problem is, it's a bit like, with, as again I'm speaking as a chef, it's trying to break down that people have got this, it's too difficult. So from a, from a growing, do you think people have got this perception that it's just too difficult to grow and it's, that we're actual fact, I talked about this with John Christoph earlier on, yeah. is that actually cooking isn't that difficult. Yeah. It's only as difficult as you want to make it. Absolutely. So it's the same with, and it's the same with, it's the same with growing as well. Well, the really, the really, I think, quite hilarious thing about growing your own is the standard yeah. advice about growing your own actually will generate the worst flavour <laughs> and give you the highest amount of input. Like, you'll have to do the most work for the least results. And it's basically because they stem from agricultural textbooks from the 40s. And in the 40s, we were really concerned about feeding the nation, about pure calories and getting on the table. We weren't concerned about flavour at all. Sure. Um, oh, yeah. And so it was about all the effort you could possibly do to get more calories from that spare piece of land. In tiny front gardens, when people are growing their own tomatoes, they're not trying to get as many tomatoes as they can. They're trying to get good flavour. In fact, you don't really water that much, you don't fertilise it at all, you almost don't prune it at all, you do as little as you possibly can. You end up with slightly stressed out plants that produce less crop, but the flavour just goes off the scale. So, um, most flavour chemicals are plants have stress chemicals. Uh, so when they're slightly unhappy, they actually give you better results. Absolutely. have most of it in all scientific trial based. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thanks very much for joining us, James. Bye, everyone. Thank you, James.